can, we can hop in. All right. So I always, I always start people off in what I think is a fairly easy way to get, get things going. But um, you know, Nathan Devon, you're in an elevator, you're meeting a stranger. You got 30 seconds to kind of explain who you are, what you do, what would be your little 30 second elevator pitch. Wow. Okay. Um, Nathan Devon, um, multimedia artist, um, typically known for making custom jackets for customers. Okay. So, yeah. All right. I like that. I like that. Now my first real, my first real question for you, how much pressure comes with potentially just totally fucking up somebody's face on a, on a piece of art? That's actually surprisingly a question I haven't gotten before. Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Like I do a pretty good job of setting expectations. So, I mean, I think they know sort of the level of realism I, I do. There's obviously people who are like insanely good at it. Um, and, and so I, I send usually a sketch before or just an idea of what it'll look like before just to set that expectation and um, just do my best. And then, you know, sometimes there's the little tweaks that the customer will point out. And sometimes I'm like, okay, that's, that's valid. And then sometimes I'm like, all right, they're reaching a little bit, but you know, <laughs> got to make sure that, you know, I want to, I want to end the experience with the customer in the best way possible. Cause that's, I think probably the best, best form of marketing there is, is, is that good interaction, that word of mouth. So um, yeah, luckily it hasn't gone so bad as to where like, you know, have to pay them completely their money back or anything like that. I, I have had to start over one time cause mm -hmm. I made the whole thing too big. Um, and you know, that was tough, but you know, got, got it done. And happy customer at the end of the day. So I always, I always wonder with the portraits, like, you know, you see some of these, I feel like the, there's like the famous, like Peyton Manning, like hall of fame buff. There's the Cristiano Ronaldo one where these people like they're recreating a human and it just does not, <laughs> doesn't quite turn out the way that uh, the person actually looks. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when it comes to that too, like, you know, I've done some for people where like the customer really likes it, but then like I'll post it on TikTok or whatever, you know, those comments can go wild and they're like, oh, it doesn't look anything like them or anything like that. And I just try to brush it off. Like as long as the customer is happy and like, you know, I'm like even Drake, right? Even Drake doesn't have every single song that hits, you know, I might have a couple of pieces here and there that won't be like perfect, so, but I'm doing the best I possibly can. So mm -hmm. that's and, kind of my motto with it. And you, uh, you mentioned, you know, you're a multimedia, you, you kind of vary in styles and, and a approaches even like you know you do a lot of portraits and you're doing pictures of, of humans but you also you know you do cartoons and you kind of do more stylistic drawings do you have a favorite or a preferred you know approach or type of thing that you're actually creating yeah I mean I think like naturally I graduate or uh, gravitate doing like people in, in portraits um, it's just kind of interesting for me and you feel like you sort of get to know them or, or sort of, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're just kind of fun to, to do humans. And, um, but like in terms of like the actual style and technique, like I'm, I'm all over the board. Um, my digital stuff sort of has like, that I've kind of been getting into now sort of has my own hand to it. And that's just because it's not coming off a of commission. It's kind of completely my own, own thing. And so that's kind of been fun to sort of introduce and, and develop. So I'd say like, from a digital lens, I kind of have a style, but when it comes to the painting and the commissions I do, I'm, I'm all over the board. Um, you know, I, I try to, with my brand, like empower the customer to sort of like, you know, what they want um, and, and inspire them to be creative is sort of at the mission of, of the brand. And so, um, you know, whether that's landscapes or portraits, whatever it might be, I definitely give, give a lot of freedom. Um, so, yeah. And to maybe go all the way back to the beginning, I understand you've been drawing since you were you know, a little kid. I, I heard some story of you, you know, you're chilling out in like third grade, you've got kids coming up to you and, and you're doing little drawings for them. You know, what, where did that interest in art start? And has that been something that's consistent throughout your life or has it kind of gone in, in peaks and valleys? Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, another good question. I, I really you know, I was just gravitating towards it as a kid. And, you know, I think I was obsessed with cartoons, um, the Sylvester, Tweety, like uh, I was definitely kind of the late, late nineties kid. And so, um, and I just would draw what I saw and draw all sorts of things. Um, and so I, I definitely had a, a love and a passion for it. And I think my parents did a good, good job sort of like feeding me stuff, giving me materials, uh, a class here or there and, um, you know, doing art classes in school, obviously. 
So I think that was, that was always a love. And uh, yeah. And to, to your point, there's, you know, in like third, fourth grade, like Yu-Gi-Oh, everyone would be, Oh, yo, draw mm-hmm. uh, Yuji for me from Yu-Gi-Oh or draw this or that. And I would just like do that. And so that was, that was fun. Um, dropped off a little bit, I'd say kind of like high school, uh, like early high school, middle school, like, I don't know, it, art, I feel like being an artist kid wasn't as, as cool or whatever. And I was mm-hmm. definitely super into sports and like those worlds were very different at that point in time, it felt like. Um, but I picked it back up late high school. I did um, advanced art um, and then kind of jumped back into it and then did a fine arts minor in college. And so it's kind of been a consistent piece throughout. Um, definitely never saw a career in art and was told multiple times that there, there really isn't a career in it. Um, and so, yeah, didn't chase it in that way. And then just kind of but but yeah, just sort of started building it and starting my thing and, and going off of there. Yeah. So so tell me about that. Like, was there was there one magic moment where you're like, oh, shit, I, I can actually like make a dollar doing this or I can make, you know, maybe potentially turn this into a career someday. Or was it like a slow build where you're like, I'm, I'm good enough at this where, you know, enough people tell you over and over and over that you can actually like make this happen? For sure. Yeah, it was a pretty distinct moment in time, actually. So you know, I, I don't know how familiar the audience might already be with this story, but, you know, basically started my business trying to pursue a graphic design job at uh, the brand I was working, working for and still working for Adidas. Um, and, you know, I wanted to be a designer so bad because uh, I love sport. I love art and being a graphic designer at Adidas would have been the perfect, you know, melody. Uh, but I had no skills. I had no technical skills with Photoshop, Illustrator. I had not gone to art school. Like they're getting obviously the best candidates in the world. It's one of the biggest sports brands in the world. And so it was, it was tough to compete. I thought I could make myself a little bit different by doing custom jackets and hand painting on jackets, showing that, you know, I can execute. It's just going to take me some time to catch up uh, with, the, with the technical computer stuff. Anyways, uh, so I did a couple of those, uh, just jackets, kind of built a little portfolio, posted it on Instagram. And then uh, someone actually asked if they could commission one for me and, and buy one. And then that's where the whole thing just kind of flipped. And then I, I went from there and, um, you know, so I, then I basically started doing commissions. And at first it was very close family and friends, uh, but then it started to, to build up from there. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that was that was that moment. But after Instagram, someone reached out, can I get a commission? And then it was pretty clear, like, you know, I didn't think I'd be making a lot doing it, but I was like, people are willing to pay for it. So I might see this thing out. So it literally started as like a resume builder in a way and, and yeah. turned into something that you're like, Oh, I can, I can spin this into something. And had you always had an interest in fashion too? Like, why did you gravitate towards, oh, I'm going to paint on a jacket rather than a canvas? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. I mean, Maybe I think I think at that time, um, you know, being in working for Adidas, you know, you're obviously paying very close attention to to trends and hype beasts and, and all that sort of stuff. And I thought that was cool. Um, and, you know, I just thought it was different. Right. I think there's just so many people doing doing canvases. It's a little bit harder to stand out. And I think the fact that I could create some kind of wearable art and I wasn't the first to do it. People have been doing it since the beginning of time. Um, but like, I just thought that could just add a kind of another element to it and, you know, help me, help me stand out. So I think that's probably what made it, I'm not like super fashionable. I mean, I'm pretty, you know, <laughs> uh, basic right now. And I like just kind of wearing basics. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a really cool place to, you know, display a piece and like, and I think what also works is like, you know, a lot of traditional artists, they have to rely on galleries and, you know, certain establishments to get their work seen and I think the cool thing about a jacket is you can just see someone walking around and you know they're so bold people go up they ask what's about what's going on and so I think that's another kind of big perk that I saw early on from from doing jackets as opposed to canvases Mm -hmm. and you know not that you have a traditional art background by any stretch but you know you grew up sketching you went to you know kind of fine you had a fine arts minor what is it what is something that's different about painting on a piece of clothing versus a piece of paper yeah yeah interesting yeah it's it's funny I've gotten so used to painting on clothing that like I actually like it's kind of like a mind fuck when I do like canvases and so I I would say uh you just have to be a little more like sure with your strokes on a on a jacket um you can like sort of erase but like that kind of starts to, to pile up um, and like it dries a lot quicker than on a canvas. And so 
you know, if you want to, under the canvas, you can get like, you know, water or turpentine and that can kind of thin the paint out and like, it'll take longer to dry where on a jacket, like you put it down and like a couple minutes, it's going to be pretty dry and set. And so, yeah, I think you just have to be pretty, pretty sure with your strokes and go over it a few more times than on a canvas. Um, uh, Cause it, yeah, it's just rougher. It's just not, a, not as smooth. Um, and so, yeah, I've kind of gotten like, that's kind of how I paint anyways. I'm not the type of person who will spend like eight hours to perfect like a hand, like I've seen like some artists do. And I think that's honestly amazing. Like it brings me to awe anytime people spend that much time and, and energy on something. Um, but I've always kind of been like, make sure at least nail the form and kind of what it, what it looks like and, and uh, keep it going from there. I mean, I thought you led me nicely into my other question for you. You, how, how long does it take to do one piece for you? Like what is yeah. sort of that process from you get the jacket, you know what the general thing is going to look like from blank can blank jacket to finished product. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, it totally depends. Right. And, and then I'm also doing a lot of bleach work lately, like bleach teas and um, you know, painting with bleach. Um, and so, yeah, I think with a custom jacket, you know, really depends. I think how many figures is usually the best kind of indicator of how long it's going to take. So, I mean, I recently posted one with like 10 figures or something like that. And that, so that took, you know, upwards of 14 hours, maybe a little bit more. Um, but if it's, you know, a simple figure, you know, I'd say probably six is the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's with every sort of step of the process of like setting my canvas first and like prepping it with white screen printing ink going in and sketching it, then, then painting it. Um, and then with the bleach stuff, it's funny, the painting actually is the part that goes the quickest. Um, and so like, I'll, I'll finish that part pretty easy. Um, but it's like the washing and being very careful with it. And like, it's gotta be timed out perfectly. The proportions have to be perfect to, to make sure it's long lasting. Um, that part typically takes longer, which is, which is kind of funny. Um, and so, so yeah, it, again, yeah, kind of ranges, but I'd say from a jacket for a jacket probably six hours to like you know 15 for some like very complex ones um for an average bleach tea probably i'd say like three hours to um three hours probably like six hours depending on the the complexity mm -hmm. and were you were you just like slinging tie-dye shirts in high school and you got into the bleach like what made you <laughs> what made you pick up the bleach as a painting option I know, right? Yeah. I mean, it was funny. It kind of came at a time where, you know, there's like right now and, and right before right now, there's kind of a big rush of people getting Christmas gifts and stuff for me. And then like historically, it's just dropped off in like end of Q1, Q2, beginning of Q2, um, because, you know, it's not really a holiday. Uh, it's getting warmer. So people aren't wearing jackets. Um, and so I kind of had a lull. And like for the first time, honestly, I had no commissions in the pipeline. And I was like, I don't know. I just want to try something like I, I don't really have time to sort of try my own thing. Uh, someone sent me a video of, of the bleach process. Again, that, that's that's nothing new. Um, but like I just saw it and, and I just tried doing it, did like four shirts just for fun. And then again, posted them. And then that was the validation, you know, that people wanted to do it. And of course, I had to figure out kind of the science of how to make them last and all of that. Um, but then I was able to kind of pick that up. But yeah, I think someone sent me a video on Instagram of someone doing is like, Hey, you should try this. And I'm like, I, I might as well. I don't, I don't have anything else going on. And then kind of picked up from there. So yeah, it's been fun. And, and is that like, are you enjoying that more now than traditional paint? It's obviously very different. Like there's not the color aspect to it. It's really like a two tone, like almost like neg, you know, I think you described yeah. it as like using like the negative, you know, space basically. Um, so how, how do you think about that differently versus, you know, painting with a full color palette? Yeah. Yeah. So bleach is even more high stakes um, in that you can't really erase. Like I can go back and add some black paint, but if I add too much, it'll be seen and, and that part could fade. Um, and so it's, it's very, very high stakes. So I really pay close attention to the sketch that I'm doing. Um, and, and yeah, it's, you're, you're painting kind of the, the negative space. Uh, I haven't, honestly gotten good enough to really understand the shading and like how to do that very cleanly. Um, and that's something I'm trying to, trying to build on, but yeah, it's been fun. It's been like fun challenging myself. And, and I used to never do color and kind of adding that tie dye color was a, another thing too. And yeah, with kind of everything I do, I want to see, you know, 
try to try to learn and kind of go in with an open mind and, and do stuff that's a little bit different. Um, Cause again, yeah, a lot of people are doing bleach teas as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a whole different process, a little bit more high stakes, but I'm having a lot of fun with it right now. I'm, maybe I'll burn out one day, but it's been, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun recently. Well, it's interesting. I just had somebody on a couple of weeks ago, this guy, Zach Aronson, and he's a paints with fire basically is the best way I can describe okay. it. He yeah. like uses torching and he paints on wood. Um, but it's very like the style of it is similar to what you're doing with the bleach and that it's really like, you know, these kind of two tones ability to like shade in different ways. Um, but it's, it, I just thought it was like another unique way of kind of use, you know, I saw your bleach, like, Oh, it's kind of, kind of yeah. similar. That's probably the most high stakes. You can yeah. Get. That's very, very high <laughs> stakes for, for, for a multitude of reasons. Safety. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, He's I'm like, he not can't touch that. Can't, can't unburn anything. I mean, how many of your clothes now are, are just covered in like little spots of bleach? Surprisingly not a ton. You know, I definitely would have thought like, I'm very, you know, very safe with it. Um, you know, I've, I think my wife tells me all the time about being safe with it. And I've got my respirator mask, got safety goggles. I open the window. I do just about everything to make it as, you know, clean as possible, um, you know, wear gloves. And so I, I actually haven't really had a big accident like that yet, um, which, which I'm lucky, but I'm sure it'll happen. And I'm sure I'll spill bleach on myself or something like that at it'll some point. But happen eventually. Do you have your own you know, where, where do you sort of operate out of? Are you working out of your house? Do you go to a studio to do this? Does it mix and match? Like how are, where are you actually like creating the, the work? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So I'm, I'm in my house. Um, and so we actually just moved, uh, last April into this place and it came with this huge bonus room in the downstairs that like, I, like, I'm pretty sure some like realtors probably overlooked it. Cause it's like down below our garage in uh, and like, as soon as we looked at this place, I was like, okay, this is, yeah, we, we should probably get this place. <laughs> this <laughs> but is yeah, so I'm studio. Set up. Yeah, exactly. I saw the studio from day one, but yeah, I'm set up down here. Um, you know, it's a, a big enough space where I can, you know, I even have like a little photo shoot area and uh, all this mess behind me and stuff. Um, and then, but when it comes to the bleach stuff, like air doesn't circulate here. So I go up to my garage. Um, and then if, like if I spill bleach here, that would be bad, like on the carpet. And so I do the bleach stuff out of my garage. And like, I bet I've, people have probably seen like my license plate and stuff from some <laughs> of my videos, uh, just cause like I'm, I'm literally in my garage. There's a car right behind me. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's where I do the bleach stuff. And I, I haven't found a, a way to really operate that in a neat way, but it's, I mean, it's fun doing it anywhere. So yeah, yeah. I've come a long way. My first studio was a was our dining room table in our kitchen. And so, you know, after <laughs> we'd have food and meals on it and stuff, and I'd come down and throw like paint and highly toxic stuff on there. So I've definitely, definitely come a long way. It's a little bit of a little bit of a better setup. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like, how, how, how many items are you working on at any given time? Are you like store, you know, do you have six jackets that you're storing in your space? Like what, what is sort of that workflow start to look like where you're, you're, you know, trying to, you're a one man show. So it's like, it's right. not like you're working on something and you're, you know, three other teammates are working on something else. It's just you. So how do you manage that, that workflow just by yourself? Yeah, it's difficult. And I've recently changed it. Um, and so, you know, I, I used to just kind of book people. It's so it mainly happens through Instagram. Um, and so, you know, I've kind of got, text replacement setup of like what the process looks like, kind of the, the timelines and everything. Um, but I, you know, I, there's times in my business where like, you know, something might go viral or something, and then I get a ton of requests. And like, I used to like book people like 20 weeks out in advance. And that had always been kind of stressful for me because like, you know, they're waiting on something and I'm just saying, well, I'm working on it. Don't worry. Like I'll get to it. I promise. Um, but like, it's just a lot. And so I've changed my format now to booking on a monthly basis. Um, and so starting uh, every, I started in October, the first of every month at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, I open up my commissions for the month, a set number of slots. Um, and so then, yeah, I, I just did one actually for, for January yesterday. Um, and so people hit me up and I'm like, okay, sorry, that's it for the month. And then, you know, February, you got another chance. And so I think, not only does it help me get a little more organized, but, you know, I think uh, it, it kind of helps like the customers, um, you know, that they might get a chance and won't have to wait 25 weeks or whatever to get uh, to get a shirt done. And so 
I think it's a win-win. It's working out well so far. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to keep rolling with it. It's, it's tough to tell people that they didn't get a spot and they woke up at 7 a.m. or whatever. That, that's probably been the toughest part. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a balance. And I, I think it's working for now. Yeah. And how, how many jackets are you doing in each month? Like how many commissions are you opening up? Yeah. Yeah. It, it really depends. Like I look at it and like the bleach tees, obviously, like I said, take a lot shorter than the, the custom jackets. And so, you know, I, I conservatively open up like four slots um, and I leave a little bit of room because like, you know, if a huge athlete or influencer hits me up, like I want to be able to act on that because that's just, you know, good, good business. Um, so I leave a little bit of room for that. Um, and then I leave a little bit of room afterwards, you know, if I finish the commissions and I'm like, Hey, you know, I can always say, Hey, spot open. Do you want some, I have an email list that people sign up for and, and I can, I can, uh, get a request through that way. Um, but yeah, I'd say so conservatively four spots, whether that be a jacket or a bleach tee. Um, and so, you know, I wish it was more, I actually, I mean, I have a, I'm a, I'm a dad, I have two kids, I have a full-time job. And so that those things are kind of <laughs> things that, I have to balance as well. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of conservatively what I can get done. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm dying to ask you about this because I watching like your content, you see what you do, you would think that this is a full-time operation, like the <laughs> amount of effort and work that you put into it. Like it's so impressive. How do you manage having, you know, a very, you know, credible full-time job, being a dad, like managing that time, to still be able to commit so much to content creation, to actually making the art to, you know, you're now getting into NFTs. Like how have you, how do you manage all of that? Yeah. It's a balancing act for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I think the one thing I can recommend like across the board for everyone is just like preparation. And so, you know, I have a finite amount of time I can work on something a day and I want to be sure that every minute is working very hard. And so like, if that means, you know, quickly getting the sketch done, like with a little bit of time, like with lunch so that I don't have to work on the sketch when I have my true studio time uh, that I can go right into, you know, painting uh, that that's a, that's a huge win. And so just getting everything prepared, getting my materials prepared so that every minute is just, you know, work, work, work. Um, and just communication with my partner. Uh, my wife's great. Um, you know, she, she supports it. Uh, which is awesome. I uh, definitely blessed, blessed for that. And so, um, you know, she's, she definitely, we work on times, you know, sometimes it's the morning, sometimes it's later, um, you know, balancing sleep schedules, you know, if a kid gets sick, I can't do it that day. Like there's, you kind of just have to have to be, be juggling it, but I'd say, you know, being prepared and just like super, uh, productive with my time is probably the biggest thing. And like, I definitely, you know, try to audit challenge my, or like audit, my time and I challenge other people who have this question for me too is like, you know, do you need to watch that ep episode of Netflix? You know, that's 30 minutes that could be working hard towards what you're trying to build. And so like me personally, like I, I haven't seen, uh, you know, what's the new one squid games. Like, I don't, I don't do that. So, like every kind of other thing goes into this and, you know, I love it that way. Um, and, and that's been great. And so, yeah, just being prepared sacrifices and communication with, you know, people that you want to, uh, that, that any partners you might have. Yeah. And so do you, do you set out, I mean, you know, four jackets on the course of a month, you're telling me some of these can take 15, 10, 15 hours. Like, is there a daily ritual for you that sort of goes into, all right, or daily or maybe weekly Mondays, I'm going to prep materials and get my sketches done Tuesday. I got two hours of studio time to get the base down and start to like, do you break it out like that? Or is it a little bit more free flowing? I probably should. <laughs> I probably should. Yeah, it's it's inter like it it really just all it depends cuz I think the kids is the biggest factor of like you just don't know like especially so one of my kids is 7 months and his sleep patterns are all over the place. And so like <laughs> like based on that day if I know that he'll sleep well at night or if like he took a weird nap in the middle of the day and he won't sleep like that night I'll use on content because I can be editing a video while I'm giving him a bottle or something like that. Or like, um, you know, I can be doing kind of other things. I can be tweeting, writing, writing copy, you know, while I'm sort of in that stage where I might need to get up and go to help him. Um, whereas, you know, on a, on a day where like, I know he'll, he'll sleep well, you know, I, I've talked to my partner about it. You know, I've, I've got two hours of solid studio time. 
I'm going to take that and, and use it. So like the stuff that can be done that requires my full energy, you know, I, I, I use it for that. And then other stuff where I might need to kind of float between work or float between being a dad, like I can in between, you know, just be smart about my time and posting content. So there's really no rhyme, rhyme or reason. It's just kind of like the, the types of things I can do to help my business at the times that make the most sense for me and my schedule and my family schedule. I just, yeah, kind of have that going on in, in my head at all times. It, it's impressive. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's impressive. It's very impressive. I'm always curious how like artists, especially people that are juggling two jobs and a family at the same time are able to, to, to do it all. Um, do your, do your kids have custom jackets yet? Have you, have you made them custom pieces? Not as many as I probably should. Like it's kind of, yeah, kind of weird. I, uh, I made one for my oldest, he's four, but like he grew out of it in like two weeks. And so I'm like, <laughs> I might just wait until they're like a little older so they can wear them for longer. Um, and so I, yeah, I don't have as many as, as I should. Um, yeah. I, and it's funny, I don't even wear them really myself. Like, I don't know why, like I, I have like a few that uh, I, I wear every now and then, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just always focused on the customer or something. <laughs> ours, ours, always getting the, the commissions in. I mean, you you've done, you've, you still hear me? Sorry. You can hear me. All right. Oh yep. Yeah. I'm with you now. Yep. Sorry. Just I'm, I'm on the, my mic is on its last legs. Every one little move and it, it, jumps out of, uh, jumps out of whack. Um, so you've, you've also done some impressive commissions for like big name athletes and celebrities. So tell me about that. And like, you know, as, as you've grown into it, I mean, I, I love the Lil Yachty story where you like, that was one of your first ones. So tell yeah. me a little bit about that. And then how it's kind of grown where you've, you know, you really built relationships with a number of athletes to be able to, to create pieces for them. Yeah. That, I mean, and that's, probably one been one of the most fun parts about the whole journey. And um, so, yeah, going back to the little Yachty story, um, back to the story of me trying to get a, a job at Adidas. So the first one I did was uh, like a little Yachty. I was super into his music at the time. I still still think he's dope. Um, but that was the, the first piece I did, posted on Instagram. And that's the one that got like attention and people reaching out. Uh, it was kind of that, that validating point. And then I think that further stamp of approval was actually um, you know, he tweeted something like, everybody send me stuff, like fans send me stuff. And so I sent him uh, the, you know, the jacket, not knowing what was going to happen with it. And then uh, he posted on his Snapchat tour. My, my friend actually texted me like, yo, check Lil Yachty's story. And then I, I checked it and it was like crazy. And, you know, I, I was not smart and didn't put any of my information on it. I literally just sent the jacket. I don't know why, but just the fact that he like saw value in it and posted was like super validating like I'm on the right path. I should, I should pursue this more. Um, and then, yeah, when it comes to the, the other relationships, uh, you know, it's just been kind of uh, free work, I think has been probably what, what has started those. Um, and so, you know, way back, I think my first kind of big professional client, uh, CJ McCollum, you know, I, there's a local entrepreneur here in the Portland area uh, who runs the brand called Portland Gear and his name's Marcus. And I've gone to a couple of his, his speeches. He's super involved in the, the community. And so I reached out when, you know, my business was kind of at a low point, just asking like, hey, you know, what could I do? And he's like, you know, you need to get your stuff on influencers to get your name out a little bit more. And so, you know, this is just a cold email. And I'm like, hey, if I make one for you, you know, would you post it and, and all that stuff? And so made one for him, um, kind of centered around his brand. He loved it. He posted it like multiple times. Um, and then, you know, probably a year and a half passes. I got, I mean, you know, got commissions and followers, like the, the foundation of it worked. Um, and then, yeah, a, a year and a half passes and he just hits me up out of the blue. Like, Hey, uh, I think CJ wants one of your jackets. Cause you know, he's obviously well-connected. He knows people. And so, and then that's when he kind of facilitated me working with CJ. I actually got to meet him, go to a game and, and build a relationship from there. And, um, you know, he's super dope. He supports all my work. Um, and so that was, and that was super validating. And then other people see that CJ and those people. Um, and so it kind of just kind of butterflies from there. And I think, you know, the moral of the story is, you know, going back, emailing someone cold, you know, delivering free work, you know, no, um, you know, no intentions going into it of like all oh, this, like you better post it and make me famous or whatever. And waiting a year and a half, right. To when he talked to CJ. So like, 
sometimes your network, like it takes longevity to really pan out. And that's what I also try to tell people like, you know, it, it's not, it might not be that instant gratification you thought it would be doing it for that influencer or that athlete, um, but it's still going to work for you. And so, yeah, just doing that. And, you know, I've done free ones for other people here and there too. Um, and, you know, now I'm blessed to have worked with, I don't even know what the number's up to now with the NFL. I, and I think it's at least 60, um, you know, jackets. Uh, and then, yeah, a few other NBA uh, players as well. So, yeah, hoping to keep it rolling. <laughs> it's 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 pretty impressive, and it's it's cool to see. You know, I, I the CJ McCollum instance is interesting because you know you get into that lock, and then you ended up doing a number of other Trailblazer players, and and it's sort of really cool to see like how that sort of snowballs, and and you start to to build that momentum there. I always like asking people this, no matter what they do, but if you could do a, a custom for anybody, any athlete, dead or alive, it could be a celebrity. Who would you want to Who would you want to make a piece for? Man, that one's that one's tough, and I've answered it in different ways before. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's so it's so hard. Like, obviously, there's my favorite athletes, but then like I think there's also something like it would be cool to do one that like for someone that represents my brand and kind of like creativity. And so like a famous artist, like so Norman Rockwell is probably one of my favorite artists. Um, so he's, he's really, and my NFTs are kind of like inspired by, by what he does. And if, if you're not familiar, the audience is not familiar, you know, he paints these really like vivid, um, like it's basically they're, they're paintings, right. But they tell such a vivid story by just looking at them and they're really cool. And so, you know, I think since he's kind of inspired my art journey and, and, you know, as a kid, just looking at his work, trying to emulate his work. I'd say, you know, doing one for him would be pretty full circle and, and cool. So, yeah, I don't actually don't know if he's I don't think he's still around. But if if he yeah, if he was, <laughs> we got we got Norman Walk, Rockwell we're walking around in a in a jean jacket it would be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, how, how do you think about that? Because obviously, you know, as an artist giving away free work, you know, how do you manage making those decisions of, all right, I, I'm going to do this thing. I don't know if it's going to pay off, but I'm going to spend 25 hours on this when you, especially you like only have so much time to dedicate to something. So how do you, how do you think about, you know, giving away some of your work for free? I'm sure you have friends and family too, are like, Hey, can you just do one for me? Or like, how do yeah. you sort of manage, how do you manage that whole process of, of giving some of your stuff away for free? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough and it's a balancing act. And I think it depends where you're at in, in your business um, and kind of what the opportunities are. Like, you know, when I first started, Instagram was still pretty new in terms of like mass adoption. And like, it was just a really powerful tool to where like, if someone posted uh, your photo, you'd get, you know, a lot of new followers um, just because like people just wanted to follow people. Like there was just, uh, it was a there was almost like a little bit of a supply deficiency because the platform was so new for people that, you know, people were liking stuff and, and stuff where now it's like, Oh, influencer post another brand thing again. Like I'm not going to even engage with that. Um, and so like, I definitely saw that as opportunity, like irons hot strike, like, and I, I was so hungry. Like I, I didn't have, you know, piles of people like behind me waiting to pay for it. So it's like, I, I really didn't have an option. I felt like if I wanted to, to grow my brand and, for me, it's a relatively cheap thing. I mean, obviously I'm putting my time in, but like all I, all I have is, is kind of time. And like, you know, that's, that's kind of what I, I can bring. Um, and so, but like the jacket itself, you know, I, I'm, I'm good about thrifting. I'm good about finding deals. Like I can, I can get that done. Um, and, and then, so, yeah, so I think that kind of where you are in your business now, it, it kind of takes a lot for me to do one that's kind of fully kind of promo driven. Um, you know, I've, I've even, now I'm doing paid commissions for, you know, athletes that are pretty high level, which is super exciting and super exciting that they find that kind of value in my work. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I'd be doing those for free for sure. Um, but I think the next part of it too, is like having your expectations set that like nothing, so maybe nothing might happen you know, something might happen and then something might happen way down the road, but you have to be okay with nothing might happen from this. And so, you know, I think once you mentally make that switch in your head, like it becomes a little bit easier because as soon as you attach expectation to it and it doesn't follow through in that way, it's going to feel like a waste. It's going to feel like a failure. But when you don't 
have that expectation. You'll be like, this piece was dope anyways. Like I'll post it on my platform. Um, and you know, that this is, uh, you know, I, I support this person and then work with people you like, like I support this person anyways. And the fact that it's hanging in their closet and, you know, it's a piece that they probably look at on the daily is still cool. Like just trying to look at the positives to it. Um, and I think just kind of getting that mental switch makes it not a, a huge leap to, to get over, you know, what could have been. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good. And then do you have like, again, how do you manage it's one thing with it's a celebrity and, or an athlete and you're like, all right, I want to do this, but I'm sure you have people that are like in your network. They're like, Hey, can you do me this favor? Can you do me the solid? Like, how do you sort of say no to those people? Um, yeah. or vice versa, how do you, how do you manage to, you know, those expectations? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that one, that one's tough too. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot better at saying no. Um, but just being honest, I'd be like, Hey, man, not to like, it's not a good time right now. Like I really need to focus on, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like I, I can't get, get back to it, but like, let's circle back, you know, when I have my lull in like April where, you know, maybe things won't be as, as busy. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've like w- one of my best friends wanted one and it was, took like two years, but he was still super stoked when he, when he got it. And so just said it, it being honest, setting the expectation. Um, and you know, a lot of my close network people, like they know, and they know kind of like, you know, how, how busy I am with this, how seriously I take it. And like that, it is kind of a big, you know, it, it takes a lot to do these things. Um, and so a lot of kind of know and respect that and like, they're okay with whatever timeline and some of them really like they want to pay for it. And so I'll say that's not happening as much from a friends and family perspective than it was when I was first starting. Um, just cause I think, yeah, people know a little bit more, but that's, that's sort of my approach to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Obviously the, the athlete piece has been great for marketing, but you do such a great job with content and, you know, you have 30,000 some odd followers on Instagram. You have, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok. How, how do you approach the marketing aspect of it and the content creation aspect of it? Cause that's obviously been a huge driver for, for your business as well. Oh, 100%. And yeah, it's, it's been huge. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, for me is, is trying to, I, I don't have a, a marketing budget. I can't go buy an ad in a newspaper. Not that anyone even reads those anyway. So I'm, I'm looking for, and how Gary Vee, one of my favorite entrepreneurs puts it, underpriced attention. And so in 2017, that was definitely Instagram. You know, people were looking at it. It was, you know, getting a lot of traction now. And even, you know, back in late 2019, TikTok was that place where, you know, your stuff will get seen. There's so much organic reach because it's a new platform that's trying to establish itself. Um, you know, there's, again, the supply problem. There's not a lot of supply in the pipeline. Um, so you're going to get eyeballs on your stuff. And, and that honestly hasn't really dwindled as much with TikTok yet. Um, and so that's why I'm attacking TikTok. So I'm first kind of identifying those spaces. Um, and then, you know, I just, I really don't try to overthink it too much. Um, I've had a lot of success with like how to's, um, you know, so how do, how do I do this? How do I think about this? How do I kind of those videos and then just process, you know, process of me painting it. Um, you know, that those do, I don't try to overthink it. I'm, I'm really just documenting and answering questions to people. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I go with it there. Um, and yeah, I've got a, a few that hit. Cause I think at, at the end of the day, right. Someone watching your content wants to be either, entertained, whether that's laughing, you know, cool, uh, or like educated. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to through those filters, you know, doing that or feeling some kind of escapism and whether that's me, you know, doing these, you know, beautiful strokes of painting or whatever. Um, and so like trying to really think about what is the consumer getting out of my content, I think has also made it successful. Um, and so like, that's probably how I discovered like telling stories behind my TikToks, you know, having, you know, people can kind of feel what, what I'm going through and being like very authentic and just being, you know, super myself. Like I don't, I don't put on a show of like, I'm, I'm the same person. And I think, yeah, I think leaning into that too. So yeah, thinking about the consumer, um, you know, being authentically yourself and looking for those areas of where the underpriced attention is and, and really attacking those, I think has been probably my, my recipe for success. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super impressive what you've been able to, to build with the, the content arm of, of your business as well. Like how I would think as an artist, it would almost be 
I don't want to say distracting, but probably it adds a whole other element of like, you're trying to film what you're doing. You're taking a time lapse, you're filming strokes. You're like, is that a, how do you build that into your, to your process? Yeah, it's, it's tough for sure. Like it's second nature for me now. Like I got the time lapse going, but I see videos of artists that like they'll film every single stroke that they do and edit that. I'm like, man, I, I don't got that type of time. Like I, I need to work on my stuff. Um, but yeah, so I get the I get the time lapse going, make sure the phone's charged. Um, yeah, I got like this thing that just goes like above my my desk or whatever I'm working on, um, and and then just just go and you know I'm I'm I just again just document 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 I'm documenting everything I'm documenting me shipping it like writing the thank you note like every little part of the process because I think that's really what people want to see, and it's just yeah it's just become second nature to me. Um, you know, when I first kind of discovered that I could do a time-lapse recording and post it to my stories, like it was just like the biggest like win for me. Like people could see even just like the space I'm working on, which I think people thought was cool. Um, and so I think just, I've discovered, yeah, the more I show the, the, the better the content is. And so I've just kind of been sticking with that mantra. Um, and so, yeah, it, it took a little bit to get used to now it's second nature, but I couldn't encourage, you know, artists more to at least you know, document as much as you can of that, of that process. Yeah. And you're just, you just have, it seems like phone is on recording at some point in 24 seven and in the, at least the artistic process of what you're, what you're doing. Definitely. Yeah. And it's funny, I'll, I'll miss some stuff too. And I'll be like, ah, oh, man, or like it, it's not in focus or something like that. And you know, that that's, but at the end of the day, those aren't usually that big of a deal, but yeah, but yeah, just, just trying to have it, have it on and, and document. Well, it's interesting if like full circle type moment from the Liliati example of like, I, I you, you were probably so devastated that you're like, I didn't have a video of me making this whole thing. And then now, of course, like, you know, you're, you're documenting everything. It's, it's kind of, kind of funny. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely learned, learn from, from mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, I, I always love asking this of artists because, you know, you've been doing this forever since the time you're a little kid, you've been, you've been making your art. How how do you like the business element of it? Because what you're doing, there's a whole, there's a whole side of it that is, is probably, you know, happens off camera or happens, you know, behind the scenes a little bit more managing the finances, managing the inventory, managing the booking system, all of these things that go into running a, you know, setting up an LLC, an LLC, a website, you know, all of those things. How, how do you enjoy that piece of it? And how have you learned that element of, you know, being an artist, but also, all right, I'm going to make money from this. I got to turn this into a, a legit operation. For sure. Yeah. And that's kind of the theme of the new kind of book I'm, I'm putting out. Uh, so I, I do these sort of recaps of every year called like volumes. I don't know if I have one handy, but anyways, this is year five of my business. And it's, and it's, it's the theme is called business mode. Cause I've had to think about these types of things like a lot more, like in terms of structuring when I get my commissions done, um, uh, you know, yeah, all, all sorts of things like that. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I've had a lot of, of fun with it, surprisingly, like I'm not super, you know, numbers wise. And like, I don't know what I'm, I'm doing with a lot of this stuff and taxes is a whole nother thing. Um, and so, but like, I'm just so passionate about what I'm, what I'm doing. Like it makes kind of learning about that stuff fun. And it's just good knowledge to have, I think in, in general as well. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking at it from that perspective is just like I'm learning so much um, that that I can kind of just use use in life and I think when you're so passionate about the subject matter of whatever you're doing like that it's it doesn't feel like you're you know uh, it's a hassle to update my spreadsheet or you know um, yeah work on shipping or, 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 or whatever so it's yeah it's I've had I've had fun with it I guess okay yeah it's, it's always curious because I feel like there's some artists that are like the business stuff that's not for me i want to do the make the art has uh, yeah, yeah has turning it into a business taken any of that love away from it of the actual like doing thing where you're like oh i gotta turn out four of these this month again or i gotta do six of these or whatever has it taken any of that love of of the actual act of the art away from you that's a great question yeah yeah not not yet not yet um yeah, it's funny. Like I'll be stressed, you know, I've got like five in the pipeline or something like that. But like the moment, like I start doing it, like I just like get lost. And like, I don't know, that to me is like an indication of like, you really love what you're doing. So like, 
for you, maybe it's, you know, podcasting, doing stuff like this or listening to an amazing podcast and you just feel lost and you're just, you're just having so much fun with it or you're playing sports and you're just in that zone. And so like, as soon as I get in, in that zone, like I just have, I did, like, it just, I'm just painting and it's just fun. It's just natural. And just, you know, uh, I had the same love I've had for it ever since I was a kid doing it for free or for whatever. And so, and it, and it doesn't matter who it's for, the commission is for, if it's for CJ or for my grandma or something like that, like I still have that, that love for it. And so I'm very aware of that. And like, I think the second it doesn't feel like that for me, like I'll definitely take notice. Um, but I think I've been a good, good job sort of mentally, like, you know, thinking about it and like, it's supposed to be fun. And I think the second it's not fun, I'll, I'll probably pivot. Um, you know, I might, I might do something different. Um, and so, but yeah, so far so good with that. And, and definitely it's on my mind. Okay. That's, well, that's good to hear. Is, <laughs> is, is there anything as you go forward with this business that you're thinking about for growing it? You know, you're a one person operation. There's probably only so many hours in a day that you can dedicate towards it. You know, one, would you want to do it full time or do you like it as kind of a side side thing? And then two, if yes, would you want to hire more people out, get a bigger studio, build a team? Like, how are you sort of thinking about growing what is, you know, right now a, a one person operation? Yeah, great, great question. And yeah, I've, I've sort of been, you know, playing with this one a lot lately. Um, so the goal, the goal is going full time with this. Um, and so, you know, that means definitely growing, probably getting more, more, personnel, um, and, and becoming, yeah, kind of some bigger than, than just commissions. Um, and so, you know, initially it was about kind of opening like an agency around this. And, um, it's cool because like I said, I've sort of built a, a little bit of a network. And so I have kind of a, a client base, a little bit built in already. Um, and then I know other artists as well. And I, I thought it'd be cool to kind of have an agency and, and the whole mission behind my brand is, uh, you know, inspiring people to be creative like that could kind of be the mission of the agency. Um, but I kind of learned about myself. Like, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet as far as like a managerial level. And like, there's so many different moving parts. The more people you add, it's just a lot more complex. And so what I've been focusing this year more is more like streams of revenue. And just because um, commissions are great and they're my biggest stream of revenue by far, but it's just a very clunky business model to scale. I'm only one person. We said it before. And like, everyone comes in different shapes and sizes needed by so it's a lot of energy and so having kind of separate spokes of like revenue can help you know kind of alleviate that so i'm not just so reliant on it and so that's where i've kind of been exploring into nfts into prints um into in, into bleach tees you know maybe trying to do my own kind of like line and uh, into apparel i tried doing shirts um and so trying to find like streams of just basically making bigger streams of revenue, I think is the biggest thing that's going to help me go full time with this. And then just trying to understand like how many of those revenues, how many of those commissions do I need to do that can comp what my salary is right now to make it. So it's like, I think when, when I'll finally make that transition is when I'll realize I'll be losing money by working in my, my job instead of doing this. And so that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, and so that's going to take a long, long time, but I think the more kind of, as I continue to develop these streams of revenue, um, and then, you know, some might require getting a team behind it, um, is, is I think is how I can get there. Um, but yeah, still just very much brand building mode at this point, trying to grow my brand as big as possible. And I think, you know, I think that can sort of start, yeah, establish those streams of revenue a little bit more and then identify areas I might need help and to bring people in. So that, yeah, that's a cool way to think. I've never heard anybody say that you would, you know, that your sort of deciding point would be when I feel like I'm losing money by still working my full-time job. I like that as like a frame of frame of reference. A lot of people are like, well, yeah, if I make X number of dollars, I can then go and quit my job. But that's a, that's an interesting way to, uh, to think about it. Tell me, tell me a little bit about, you know, I want to touch on this quickly of the NFTs and the digital art is not something that you've done you know, historically looking at your business, but, you know, it's something that you've jumped into recently, getting an iPad, jumping on Procreate, you know, launching your first sort of collection of NFTs. How, how has that been jumping into that world? Cause that's, 
drastically different than doing commissions from reference photos mm -hmm. on jackets, like very, very different. So how, how have you enjoyed jumping into that world? Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the word that describes it. It's, it's so different and different from not only a medium perspective and sort of how I have to think about it, but like a marketing perspective and like, there's people who don't trust crypto and all of that stuff uh, yet, of, of course. So like, and, and what I've noticed is, you know, I, I, I have a decently big audience right now, but the audience that is into investing in NFTs is totally different. And it's not, there's not a lot of overlap. And so I'm almost having to kind of start over, which has actually been really fun um, just starting from zero and trying to build something up. Um, but yeah, the motivation to get in honestly is just seeing artists that are actually making art look like a full-time viable option. And I haven't seen that yet other than like the, obviously the super famous you know daniel arshams of the world um and you know I've, I've i've been starting to when i started to see it more often like i'm like this like this means something and this is like a sign and so and then there there's that and then there's the other mind frame i have like i also don't want to get lost in the du dust like everything is moving towards this digital world and if i can't kind of adapt or at least know what's going on in it like i'm i'm just going to get lost like i'll i'll become irrelevant and so i think kind of those two things kind of learning like you know mode of survival um as well as like these people are making art look like a full time viable option like that that was attractive and so yeah, invested in, you know, iPad and, and digital and just kind of starting to learn that and still have a ton to learn with that medium and then a ton to learn in terms of marketing. It's a whole, it's a whole different thing, but it's been fun. I've been lucky enough to have three sales already, which is exciting. And, um, and then I'm trying to do something a little bit different too. So the, the art and the NFTs I'm making, uh, they have utility behind them, you know, meaning that just by holding one of my pieces digitally, you can have access to other physical goods. Like I'm doing a, a free giveaway to the people that have the NFT. And right now that's a pool of three people. And so there's a very high likelihood for those people. And so just kind of giving ex incentives to, to hold on to these tokens. Um, Cause that's, that's kind of what they are to me. They're, they're tokens that represent my brand. And so um, that's, that's how I'm, I'm pitching it and in, in working with it. And yeah, we'll see. It's it's been fun though. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of new learning. And I think I'm not alone in people that are trying to learn about this space. Um, and so yeah, kind of beginning in on it semi early has been been exciting. Yeah, we could probably we could probably do a whole other podcast on NFT world with artists and things like that. It's it's kind of the wild west right now, but it's fascinating to see like the careers and like the real money that can be made for artists in that in that space. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's, and it's like, it, and artists have been screaming, like, finally, you know, like it's cause it's been, you know, Instagram and other kind of platforms have almost taken the value out of like owning digital art or owning a photograph or something like that. And like, you know, now this, this sort of wave and this, um, you know, this ledger that is the blockchain of like, you know, really authenticating people's work, um, and as they start to build their profile and a really easy way to sell work on the secondary market too, I think is really important um, is, is like, yeah, they're saying like, finally, like this is people are valuing art more. And I think that's, that's even more exciting for artists than, you know, the, you know, the big headlines that you see, the fact that, yeah, people are actually willing to pay now and care a little bit more and that there's, there's talks about it. There's like, I was listening to a quick Twitter space yesterday of like, yeah, I'm an NFT collector now. And like, I've never been interested in like, now I look at art different and stuff like that. So like, there's people, you know, going, coming into the art world that it's a whole new audience. And I think that's the really, really exciting part about it. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And do you, do you have a preference, you know, the digital art versus the physical art? Are you, are you liking one more than the other? Yeah. I think it's a little too early for me to make that call just because I like I still I'm, I'm still very much learning the, the digital. Um, I'd say there's there's definitely adva advantages and disadvantages like the, the way you can erase in digital art and like, you know, not have to completely start over to do stuff is really appealing. And that, that's probably a fun thing. But um, there's still just some stuff that's just not quite natural for me on, on the, on the iPad and like making sure that it's high quality and like kind of those technical things, like even the size of the canvas is something that's like in kind of bends my mind a little bit. Um, 
but it's it's been fun but yeah at, at this point in time i'd say i still prefer physical it's just natural it's just like you know I'm, i just feel a little more one with the with the mediums and i think that a lot of that just comes from like just the way i've always been doing it and so we'll see we'll see if that changes but right now the the physical art is definitely in the lead all right okay uh, i got two more questions for you the first being if you could go back to the st- we'll say the start of devo customs you know you're at the beginning of just getting this business going maybe you, s- you have just sold that first that first jacket online what would you tell yourself? What piece of advice would you give to yourself looking back to when you first kicked this thing, kick this thing off? Whew. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I would say, say patience. Um, and I was very, very patient with it. Um, you know, I'm a very like conservative person. Like I know when I can like over leverage myself and and stuff like that but I think I wasn't totally patient in the mindset of like I'm gonna like I was like oh 3,000 followers by the end of the year which is like super arbitrary anyways um and you know I was I was like hiring I was like working with people like already that like I don't know if I was even ready to work with with people um and so, yeah, I think, I think I just kind of wanted it all. And I, I recognize that the, you know, the iron was hot to, to strike. Um, but I think just kind of patience, you know, really strategically looking at, um, you know, what's going to help build my business. And like, I think looking back at it, what I would have done differently is probably do even more promo pieces of like free for influencers and like, just go all in on that. Um, and, uh, I think that's probably what I would, I would have done different, um, but you know, I think you live and you learn, and that's how you pick up those lessons. Um, okay, so that was the first one. Did you say there was, that was there another yeah, part to this? Oh, okay. No, that was that was part one. Okay, my, so my last question, I so I end every show with the sign off of stay weird. So I'll ask you, Nathan, what makes you weird? What makes me weird uh is that I have just kind of a I don't know, maybe like a lack of a lack of fear or like a kind of overcompensation of accountability. Like I have no problem saying like my fault, my bad, I messed this up and I'll even show people how I messed it up in some of my content. Um, and then a lack of fear of trying new things, digital or, you know, learning about certain things. I think that's what kind of makes, makes me weird. Um, in that way. And then there's a million other things that makes me weird, but <laughs> I'd say in the, in the business context, that's probably what makes me weird. All right, cool. I like that. <laughs> All right. So if, if the listeners of this show want to follow along, if they want to get a commission, where can the listeners of this show follow along with you on the internet? For sure. I'm so I'm website devocustoms.com and then I'm at Devo Customs on basically every platform, um, you know, to Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, YouTube, Facebook. Um, so that's pretty, pretty simple there. Um, and then I'm on, on OpenSea as well. So that's kind of the NFT platform. And so if you're looking at there, but yeah, I think if you go to, um, I think my Instagram is probably where I'm, I'm most active and kind of most paying attention. So at Devo Customs on Instagram, I've got a link tree that kind of links to every other part of what I just said. And so that's probably the central place if you're if you're interested, want to learn more, or even want to get a commission. So, all right, cool. Yeah. We'll get you, we'll get y'all linked up in the description. But Nathan, thank you, man. This was this was awesome. Absolutely, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate uh, the time to tell my story, and so yeah, hope to do it again. Cool. All right, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Thank you, man. That was <laughs> that was great. You were easy. You were, I could have talked to you for three hours. <laughs> no, that was that was fun, man. A lot of different questions that I don't typically get about like the technical side of yeah. like the art too. Like, I think everyone wants to kind of hear about the, you know, the success stories and stuff, but that, that was, that was fun to really dive into that. that yeah. Kind of I, I like to try and at least like with every, like all these people are such, such different, you know, nobody is doing bleach shirts. Like it's like always, <laughs> I think it's for me, at least it's I'm mostly driven by my own curiosity, but like, yeah. I, I'm curious how like you actually like execute those things. No, it's, it's fun, man. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, so we recorded, recorded this, um, can I use it to like chop up and do hundred percent? Yeah. So I'll, so I'll send you, so I can send you like the full video and audio, um, once this exports and I'll send it over to you and you're 
by all means, do it as you please. You can cut clips. You can do all that stuff. Um, I, that's what I typically do. I'll do a couple of like promo clips of fun little quotes or whatever. Um, yeah. So I'll, awesome. I'll probably borrow a few of those as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I'll send over the full the full recording. Uh, so you can you can do with it as you please. 100 percent. Awesome, man. And then, is I mean, yeah, get back to me whenever if when it's like dropping to because I'd love to obviously promote it and get people to, to listen to it. For sure. Stuff. Yeah. So it'll either be I've got it'll either be this week. So I'm waiting for approval on one one uh, episode, but it's, it'll either be this Thursday's episode or next Thursday. Um, awesome. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you know what day it's, it's dropping and I'll be sure to, you know, I usually try and send around an email like the morning of and just say, Hey, this is live. Here's the links. Um, and I'll, I'll shoot that over to you as well. Dope. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm excited to listen back to it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I go on these tangents and I'm like, I have no idea what I just said, but he's nodding. So <laughs> it is, I, I will, after a hundred plus of these, I'm like, I've gotten a little bit used, more used to like the sound of my own voice, but it, it never is easy. Listen back to yourself for the, the first couple of <laughs> times. Yeah. How's it been with that too? Like is, yeah, I mean, yeah, we've been doing a hundred episodes. So, I mean, you're obviously loving it and it's starting to grow a little bit, right? Like, yeah. It's, it's fun. It's definitely like, you know, I, I, I have a full-time job as well and, sure. and, you know, do yeah. this, do this on the side. And, um, it's something that I think I'm like, you know, especially going into the new year, like trying to figure out like, all right, how can I, how can I make this more of a conscious effort? Like, I think I do a great, you know, not a great job, but I do a, obviously being able to do a hundred and get you know, different people and, and be able to do the interview part, but the actual like marketing of the show and, and sort of building an audience that way, I think is like what I really want to work on in the, in the new year. So it's been going well though. Yeah. Like, you know, I have a kind of loyal listener base and then you definitely see like spikes when you have a, a guest who promotes it heavily or, you know, you'll post something in a Reddit thread that all of a sudden takes fire and you get a bunch yeah. of listens. So like there's, there's random sort of peaks and valleys, but yeah, it's been kind of slow and steady just keeps on, keeps on growing in terms of listenership. That's dope. That's yeah. Dope. yeah. I mean, it clearly looks like you love it too. So it's a win-win all around. So. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun, it's been fun for me. And it's like, it honestly is mostly just driven by like, I you know want to start my, it's a lot of what I learned is like, I'm trying to now put back into the podcast in some ways from all these people I'm listening to or creating content or starting their own business or creating in some way. For sure. For sure. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I don't want to take too much more of your time, but this was, uh, this was awesome. And, um, um, you, you've definitely gained a new fan. I'm like, I'm hyped to kind of just keep watching what you do and, and, <laughs> and watch what you've got, you know, coming up in the, in the future here too. Right on. And yeah. And likewise, man, I'm excited to have the people listen to this. So For I appreciate sure. the time. For sure. All right, brother. Well, have a good week. I'll send over this, uh, this video and everything, and then I'll let you know when, when we're live but have a good week and uh I'll, we'll talk soon sounds good all right all right awesome. appreciate it take care brother